In the limited time I have, I wish to focus on a specific challenge posed by China's techno-nationalism. Experts acknowledge China's efforts to force foreign multinationals to transfer strategically sensitive technologies to indigenous Chinese firms on firms favorable to the Chinese. In my written testimony, I describe how this pressure is applied, how these actions can distort global trade, how they can actually depress the global rate of innovation, and the ways in which these actions violate China's WTO obligations. We need a policy response that can change this behavior without stirring up a trade war that causes more damage to all parties than the behavior we seek to deter. In my view, such a policy response can only be effective if it's closely coordinated with our allies. The appropriate response will therefore be multilateral, but narrowly focused on the kinds of behaviors we seek to change. Unfortunately, multinationals are often extremely reluctant to publicly disclose the ways in which they are being pressured to transfer technology to China out of fear of retribution from the Chinese state or its state-owned enterprises. To overcome that problem, we need a mechanism that enables and requires multinationals to disclose these details. In 2017, Senator John Cornyn and Congressman Robert Pettinger introduced legislation designed to give the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States the power to limit outbound foreign direct investment and technology transfer. In my written testimony, I proposed a number of changes to the original architecture of this bill that would correct what I believe to be some of its most important flaws and make it a more effective instrument in combating forced technology transfer. First, let me emphasize my belief that America benefits when U.S. multinationals are permitted the freedom to invest in and operate their affiliates when, where, and how they see fit. The original Cornyn Pettinger bill awarded the chief executive dangerously broad discretion, in my view, to curtail the activity of U.S.-based multinationals outside the United States. Powers an injudicious or protectionist chief executive might be sorely tempted to abuse. I therefore propose that the broad discretion granted to the chief executive in the original bill to define so-called critical technologies be replaced by a well-defined interagency process that engages federal science agencies in the task of drawing up a far more circumscribed set of technologies whose transfer to indigenous Chinese entities could pose a meaningful threat to U.S. national security. I also propose that the discretion granted to the chief executive in the original bill to define so-called countries of special concern be replaced by a second interagency investigative process defined in statute that would set clear criteria for the designation of a country as a country of special concern with respect to these issues. The process would leverage the exercise of subpoena power and the resources of our intelligence agencies to prove that any nation suspected of engagement in forced technology transfer or large-scale misappropriation of American technology was, in fact, engaging in this behavior on a scale and to a degree that posed a meaningful threat to U.S. national security. In my view, a well-designed process with an appropriately high evidentiary standard would wind up including only a handful of countries in the set of countries of special concern, and perhaps the only economically large members of this set would be China and Russia. Finally, I strongly opposed granting CFIUS or any other agency new or enhanced authority to block outbound foreign direct investment by U.S. multinationals, even in countries of special concern. Instead, new policies should focus solely on technology licensing or transfer of critical technologies to unaffiliated indigenous parties that can be reasonably viewed as operating under the influence of the governments of countries of special concern. These changes significantly narrow the new authorities that would be granted to the federal government to regulate U.S.-based multinational activity. Under my proposal, U.S. multinationals that wish to transfer technologies in specifically designated critical domains to indigenous Chinese entities would have to disclose their plans in advance to CFIUS or to a CFIUS-like interagency, power with subpoena power, uh, interagency panel with subpoena power and access to the global resources of the U.S. intelligence community. If firms were transferring technology to Chinese entities in ways or under terms that deviated sharply from their commercial practice elsewhere in the world, they would be required to explain the discrepancy. In essence, they would need to reassure the reviewing panel that the technology transfer was not being forced in order to receive government approval. Now, the point of this is not to empower the federal government to intervene in the actions of private firms. It's my hope that uh, you know, this power would be exercised very, very rarely. Instead, the key benefit of this procedure is the information it will bring to light. Multinationals that might otherwise be pressured into silence will now tell their Chinese interlocutors that they have no choice but to disclose their true circumstances since silence or partial disclosures could be met with a subpoena or contradicted by the findings of intelligence agencies. 
And the information disclosed through this process could enable the federal government to identify the specific Chinese entities that benefit from forced technology transfer, the top executives of those Chinese entities, and the Chinese government officials involved in brokering the transfer. These entities and individuals could be sanctioned using existing authorities provided by the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, and these sanctions could involve travel bans, foreign asset freezes, and financial and trade penalties on the firms and products benefiting from forced technology transfer. America's allies possess similar statutes to IEPA and can participate in enforcing multilateral sanctions against these entities. The devastating impact of the recent sanctions imposed on ZTE illustrate what we can do when we really want to sanction a foreign enterprise. If we play our cards right, we can substantially raise the costs and lower the benefits of forced tech transfer for the Chinese entities currently benefiting from it, potentially changing their strategic calculus in helpful ways. Now, these actions are not without risks or costs, but the very focused nature of the sanctions and restrictions we would apply suggests that any Chinese retaliation would be similarly focused and targeted, limiting the downside risk and preserving the benefits we get from the dimensions of the US-China economic relationship that work well. The Trump administration's current approach to US-China trade frictions is, in my opinion, all but certain to fail to address the problem of forced technology transfer. But there's still time to move toward a better approach. For the sake of our nation's economic future, let us not only hope that this happens, but do everything in our power to ensure that it does. Congress can help through legislative action that builds on a proposal that is already garnering bipartisan support, even in these hyperpartisan times. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Brandstetter, you talked about rather than identifying countries of concern in legislation, correct me if I'm wrong, let's have a process to do that. I think China's a country of concern. Would you agree or should we have a process? So why not just say it? Yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I, maybe I'll take a, uh, you know, uh, some, some words from, from Graham Webster. I think it's important that we discipline actions, right, not peoples or countries. So if we have, you know, clear criteria for this designation and a process that actually documents the behaviors that we think are happening and that firms come to many of us privately screaming are happening, you know, but are uh, reluctant to come forward with, uh, you know, explicit details. If we can document this, right, then that actually creates an incentive for China to change, but we also have a mechanism by which we can monitor their behavior and actually determine whether haven't they're changing we, or haven't not. Haven't we documented it enough, though? Mm -hmm. I, you know, look, I, you know, I agree to look at Iran or Russia or others. I mean, you know, in China, we now have a three, four hundred page report on IP. We have yeah. the great yeah. IP commission report, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, all, all I'm saying, we now have the ARM, you know, transaction that mm -hmm. China is seeking to acquire 51 percent. They are, ARM is probably one of the most critical feeder technology companies in terms of chipsets, as I understand it. If we don't do something, China's going to own ARM. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I have no doubt, right, that any you know, well-constructed process will identify China as a country of concern. Right? I do think it is important that we have this process. I think we already have some information that we could leverage. I don't think that this investigatory process would need to take very long or consume a lot of government resources. But I think the key thing that I want to you know, emphasize in the statements that I made earlier and in my written testimony is that I think it's very important that we have a monitoring mechanism that identifies when our companies are being subjected to pressure to transfer strategically significant technology. That provides specific information that will enable our government to act in a focused way. How do you impose sanctions on these specific entities instead of China when we know this comes from, this is part of a central government plan? I, can you can you explain that that which seems like an inconsistency, which I'm sure it is not. Uh, well, it, it's certainly not uh, designed to be an inconsistency. So the basic idea um, is perhaps best illustrated by example, right? What what we often find, uh, and what perhaps members of the commission have heard in private discussions with U.S. multinationals, um, is that the pressure to transfer technology can arise uh, through two channels, many many channels, but principally two. 
One is the nature of China's FDI regime, which closes important sectors of China's, tech, uh, China's economy uh, to wholly owned or majority owned foreign enterprises so that you have to form a joint venture with the Chinese entity. Uh, you don't exercise control over this Chinese entity in all cases, and you necessarily have to transfer uh, sensitive technologies to the Chinese entity uh, in order to uh, realize the commercial value from, from your innovation. Now, this is statutory. This is part of China's uh, WTO accession protocol that its trade, uh, trading partners agreed to. Um, but it can, uh, it can clearly create some problems for U.S. multinationals, particularly as the nature of the market changes. Uh, another uh, 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 channel is through the role of Chinese state-owned enterprises, right, which play a very important role in what we might call the network sectors of the Chinese economy, healthcare, energy, transportation, and telecommunications. Often these state-owned enterprises very, play a very important role in deciding who gets to sell into the Chinese market. And because these enterprises' chief executives are not appointed by the, the shareholders, but they have to be approved by the party state, they can place an awful lot of weight on Chinese industrial policy objectives. Right? So they can use their position as an important purchaser to place pressure on US multinationals or foreign multinationals to transfer technology to a Chi an independent Chinese entity that they don't control um, as a kind of quid pro quo for market access. Now, China's accession protocol uh, would seem to prohibit this behavior, Right, but these uh, conditions aren't being applied through legal means, they're being applied through extra legal means. And any multinational that complains about this behavior could be worried that they would face um, sanctions from the Chinese state or from the state-owned enterprise, and also that there's probably another multinational that might agree to these terms if they don't. So, so you know, if, if I could just uh, you know, complete that. So, you know, there, there's pressure being applied that I would argue it contradicts China's obligations under its WTO accession protocol and the TRIMS agreement, but there's pressure to keep silence, right? Um, and m any multinational that voluntarily comes forward is taking a risk, right? So what I'd like to do is change the game theory by making it, uh, you know, <laughs> Much more likely that the multinational will have to disclose these terms, right? And by disclosing the terms, they would actually specifically identify the state-owned enterprise executives, the government officials that were applying the pressure, right? And that allows the United States government to sanction those companies, those individuals that are applying the pressure, right? Uh, now, there's a risk involved here, right, that could lead to retaliation. But we're not uh, uh, placing tariffs on whole industries or whole product categories. We're not subjecting tens of billions of dollars of U.S. exports to potential retaliatory uh, tariffs. We are focusing on a specific entity, a specific individual or a group of individuals or a specific firm, right? And I think that if the Chinese uh, parties that are involved in this kind of pressure were to think or expect that, you know, the threats that are whispered, you know, in restaurants in Beijing might be posted on an official government website and individuals might face real sanctions, then that might change their behavior in a really productive way. In our, again, in our work at the IP Commission, we found that our friends in Japan at the Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry have a much more holistic and coherent view. They manage both investment control and export control within one ministry, and, and here we have split jurisdictions. Any thoughts or comments you have on this issue would be valuable to hear. Um, so uh, in, in the written testimony and in my oral remarks, um, you know, I, I'm trying to uh, balance uh, you know, two objectives. One uh, is the avoidance of uh, unproductive interference right, by a federal agency or process um, and uh, the decisions of U.S. companies, right? So I think we, we only can intervene where we think there, there really is a national security concern um, or sort of a broader, uh, you know, a strategic uh, concern. And uh, that meant that what I'm recommending in terms of a review process is going to be deliberately narrow in scope and limited in focus in order to avoid that unnecessary interference. Now, what that means, right, is that the process... Uh, that I'm envisioning would not be sufficient to prevent all movements of technology to all potentially adversarial nations or adversarial non-state actors. And so we need something else uh, to uh, you know, protect us in that dimension. Um, and in that context, I think it makes perfect sense to uh, look at our existing export laws uh, and think about possibly putting them on a stronger legal footing. Uh, and improving their importance and improving the monitoring functions that are attached to those laws. Uh, but I think as a practical matter, you know, these things would probably have to, uh, you know, function 
uh, separately uh, in the U.S. because I think just getting the kind of review mechanism that I'm proposing in place uh, would take quite a bit of legislative energy and perhaps executive energy as well. I think uh, you know standing up something like uh, you know METI uh, in the United States uh, would involve so many uh, you know agencies and committees of jurisdiction. Uh, that I think it would be very, very hard to achieve that degree of coordination, although I would agree that in this, uh, in this instance, it probably serves Japanese interests. I mean, if, I, if I just uh, you know, make one brief additional statement, I mean, it's interesting that some of our allies in Asia are already either informally or formally uh, reviewing the kinds of technology transfer that their firms are engaging in vis-a-vis -vis China in the manner that I'm suggesting, and also that China has recently imposed a legal, legal obligation on its enterprises to submit their technology transfer plans to government review. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that we do something that China is not already doing uh, or that some of our uh, trading partners in Asia are not already doing. Thank you. Could each of you say if there's something specific you think we should take into account for the Congress? I know, Lee, in your case, it's the CFIUS reform, but any others? Um, I, I think I'll take advantage of my time here before you uh, to, to focus on the explicit proposal that I'm putting forward. Um, but to broaden it just a bit, right, um, it doesn't necessarily have to, re you know, the, the, the review process that I'm proposing doesn't necessarily have to reside in CFIUS. Um, and I think many of you are much closer to Congress than I am in Pittsburgh. It may be that uh, the proposal as it moves through committees is moving in that direction. But those of us who've had any connection to CFIUS in the past, I think appreciate the professionalism of that process and the way in which the balance of national security and intelligence agencies on the one side and the economic policy agencies on the other uh, almost always ensures a good balance between economic concerns and national security concerns. Um, it's also a domain in which the resources of the intelligence community are often applied, I think, in a very productive manner. So I think all of these uh, argue for um, this kind of review process either being based within CFIUS or you know, in a committee that has that kind of interagency balance. Um, and that access to intelligence agency resources. Part of the reason why I wanted to so significantly restrict uh, the original cordon Pettinger bill to focus only on technology transfer to, affiliate, to unaffiliated parties, only in certain critical dimensions of technology, and only to a small group of countries of special concern, um, is because I don't want to overwhelm CFIUS with you know, such a large docket of cases that that interagency balance would have to be changed um, in ways that, you know, frankly, might uh, you know, uh, create a prejudice against economic interests um, you know, in favor of purely national security ones. I like the balance that exists. I think it's important that that balance be maintained. If we want to do it in CFIUS, then we really need to restrict the scope of review. I thought that CFIUS was not allowed to, to consider economic concerns, so I'm confused about you talking about this balance. Now, there, are you you're talking about a corporate financial concern, which is, to my mind, not necessarily synonymous with an economic concern, but can you clarify that? Yeah, th thank you for your question. Uh, you're absolutely right, right? The writ of CFIUS is to think about national security concerns, right? Um, but consider the, uh, um, I guess, the, the inclination of the agencies at the table Right? There are different agencies at the table that are going to define national security concerns, in some cases very broadly, in some cases more narrowly. And we're, whenever we're thinking about restricting investment into the United States, right, or in this case, restricting the right of a U.S. firm to transfer some technology that it owns to uh, an indigenous party abroad, uh, we're potentially incurring economic harm. Right? So you know, calibrating the right policy response that protects our, economic, our security interests um, at the, at the uh, sort of lowest possible economic cost is uh, a difficult question in many cases. And that's uh, you know, the, uh, the dimension in which I think it's very helpful to have this interagency process that sees the problem from multiple vantage points. Does that address your question? N not really. I mean, okay. it's, it's sort Sorry. of. Well, it, again, sort of? I mean, CFIUS, from, 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 from my understanding, specifically can't deal with the economic consequences of a transaction. So I personally think that economic security and national security are completely intertwined. Not everybody thinks that way. And so when there's a CFIUS transaction, 
It's my understanding that they are not allowed to consider the impact of job loss or the impact on the community or even the impact um, within an industry that is not national security based but is economic based. I mean, does this transaction make uh, um, uh, weaken an industry in the sense that it that it uh, undermines the competitiveness within an industry. That that those are um, characteristics that can't be taken into account during a CFIUS review. Uh, no, no, that's right. That's right. So under under current uh, legislation and practice, the focus is very much on national security. Although again, you know, national security is sort of this you know broad thing that can be you know a little bit hard to define. Uh, some of our trading partners and allies have a national interest consideration that their equivalent of Civius takes into account. Uh, it's a sort of a separate question of whether we would want to change the focus of CFIUS to include this kind of national interest justification or not. Uh, I'm not an expert on how the Canadians or the Australians actually interpret this national economic interest statute and allow it to uh, you know, inform their decisions. Um, you know, as a casual spectator, it seems to me that they're able to include this consideration uh, without uh, unduly restricting foreign direct investment into either Canada or Australia. So, you know, personally, I might be open to a consideration of this, right, provided that this economic interest uh, didn't, didn't lead to sort of open-ended justification for federal government intervention and the actions of private firms. Right? I actually uh, think that there is merit to the current focus on national security because in my mind, that actually provides a clear justification for the ge federal government to step in um, and inter interfere in the actions of private firms. And you know, I think as many people on this panel might agree and certainly people in this room, there are these dual use domains of technology that, are, uh, that feature very prominently in China's industrial policy goals that relate in a clear way to future military capabilities and so my sense is that you know, even as CFIUS uh, chooses to pursue its current focus on national security issues, if it were changed in the manner that I'm proposing, uh, then some consideration would have to be made of transfers of technology that are dual use, right? And while in a particular context might be purely uh, civilian in application, could also lead to the acquisition of military capabilities down the line and would raise clear national security implications that CFIUS would need to consider even under its current statutory parameter settings. On the topic of um, what looms on the horizon in, in the issue of uh, IP loss or IP protection, yeah, so I, I'm at Carnegie Mellon, right? Uh, we think a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning. My engineering and computer science colleagues are absolutely convinced that this domain represents a general purpose technology like electricity, uh, like information technology 1.0, uh, that eventually it will impact every sector in the economy, most occupational categories. Um, and of course, there's a lot of concern in this city um, about uh, competition in this domain between the US and China. Um, so I, I, I think I agree with Mark, right? I mean, uh, of all of the sort of strategic uh, commercial frictions uh, that we're trying to manage vis-a-vis -vis China, this issue of, of technology and innovation is increasingly recognized as central, right? This is our future. Uh, I think that that's good. It's good that government effort uh, and, and uh, attention is focused on this. Um, and I think there are some specific policy steps that could be taken to better protect U.S. interests uh, in this domain. I, I won't reiterate the points that I've already made. But if, if I can look beyond what's probably going to be a pretty difficult, difficult uh, you know, 10 to 15 years in the US-China relationship to the longer run future, I mean, I think it's clear to anybody who's spent any time in China, right, uh, or has any sense of Chinese history, you know, this is a people that is capable of truly great things. Right? And the simple fact is that innovation is getting harder, right? I mean, the larger you know, the body of knowledge uh, upon which we stand becomes, the more effort is required to add to it. China could be an amazing partner, a different kind of China that played by a different set of rules could be an amazing partner in the creation of new technology, right? And I, I very much hope uh, that we will somehow be able to manage this difficult uh, period, and that on the other side, we'll you know have this real possibility of collaboration and engagement uh, that I think many of us here on the panel are hoping for. Um, you know that probably sounds a little bit uh, 
you know, uh, over optimistic, perhaps naive. But a lot of us in this room who have some gray hair know how much the world has changed over the past few generations and how things that weren't imaginable when I was much younger um, are, are now at a very different place. Right. I, I, have a, I give a lot of uh, credit and even thanks to that earlier generation of uh, American policymakers that brought us through the Cold War um, to the world that we're now living in. Um, and I'm confident that uh, as you make your recommendations to Congress that our current generation of leaders is going to act in a wise and judicious manner um, and get us to that better future. Thank you.